All right, everybody. So welcome back. We are talking about Jim Crow and segregation today. This is one of the more controversial types of topics that we get to talk about. So yeah, let's go ahead and get into it. All right, guys. Now, when you get into it, we need to talk about the New South. And the New South is, we're going to see people wanting to envision a post-Reconstruction Southern economy modeled on the North's embrace of the Industrial Revolution. So basically, people are wanting to kind of emulate what's happening up North, having factories and things like that, trying to move away from the big agricultural businesses and industries. Now, although textiles and tobacco would emerge in the South during this like late 1800s time, uh, we're gonna see the rest of the plan basically fail. Like we just have those two industries where we're gonna see factories coming up and that's about it. So by 1900, you know, income in the South was 40% less than the national average. So the South was poor during the second half of the 1800s. Uh, pop, rural poverty would be across the South well into the 1900s. And in some cases, it's still, it can still be really poor now that we're in the 21st century. Now, moving forward, segregation and discrimination. So what was life like for African-Americans? Uh, what we are seeing is the Jim Crow laws. And these are a set of laws that are meant to enforce racial separation. These are racist laws. Now, we are going to see, you know, this is the beginning of things like um, different facilities or places that are only allowing one race or the other. Uh, we're going to see the term Jim Crow being used a lot more. Now, Jim Crow or it has its origins in an 1832 song and dance performance that was done in blackface. Uh, for those of you who do not know, blackface is when you would have a white performer who would basically paint their face, their skin that would be exposed with a type of black paint or oil-based product type of thing to make them look like they are African-American. Um, and it is they would basically act as the biggest stereotypes of African-American people. And it, it is one of those things that uh, if you were to watch one of these performances today, you can't help but feel yourself getting angry because of how offensive this type of performance was and would still be today if people even did it today. Now, This is going to be like the big stereotype that is going to just follow. And pe when people think like this, it just leads to bad things. Now, moving forward, we're going to see one very important Supreme Court case. The Supreme Court of the United States is Plessy versus Ferguson is going to establish separate but equal. And it is going to legalize segregation between the, or separation of the races. Now, in 1952, Brown versus the Board of Ed is going to basically undo Plessy versus Ferguson. But now, separate but equal, it might be equal facilities being provided, but they're definitely not of equal quality, like this picture right here shows. So, like, the Whitewater Fountain looks all fancy and it's working real good, and then the one for Black people is a water pump. Not exactly what I would call equal. It's a water a source of water is provided for both, but it's definitely not of equal quality, all right? So that's one thing right there. We're going to see people trying to uh, block African-Americans from being able to vote. Um, we're gonna see this disenfranchisement happening and you're going to see stuff like uh, literacy tests, we're going to see things about poll taxes, like paying to get to vote, uh, violence from the KKK. The KKK is trying to basically persuade people to not vote through violent 
or aggressive tactics. And yeah, it's, it's a big mess, really. And it's going to do a lot more damage to the African American community that uh, really should have never happened. Now, this right here, the uh, Louisiana literacy tests, this is an example of some of those literacy tests. And like it was, these tests, they would have these questions and it might be like 50 questions. You have to get them all correct, but the answers are subject to interpretation. So there's no way to get them all correct at all. No matter who you are, like there's there's no way to get it right. Now, the KKK and other groups in the South would try to punish and control, bring fear, uh, try to maintain that pre-Civil War social and racial hierarchy. And they're going to and one of the biggest intimidation methods is going to be lynching. You know, this this is a mob murder and typically done by hanging. And uh, it is going to be very, very effective in putting fear in people, but it is, it's still murder no matter how you look at it. And a good, and most of the time, like 99% of the time, the people who were lynched did not deserve it. And there, and the people, the African American community in states where lynching was happening um, didn't really feel like they could go to anybody about it because, you know, there was a pretty decent chance that you know the judge or the sheriff or you know the cops might be a part of the lynch mob who killed the person. So, in these years after the Civil War and into the early 1900s, we're going to see what is called the Great Migration. This is a large scale movement of African Americans leaving the South, going into cities in the North, into the Midwest. So like New York, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, Detroit, Chicago, they are looking to escape Jim Crow laws, or at least places that don't have as severe ones. Uh, they're looking for better job opportunities like in all these factories that are popping up all over the place in the North. So that is a great step right there. Now, we're going to talk about some reformers. And one of the important ones that we talk about is W.E.B. Du Bois. And he was the first African American to receive his doctorate, the first black doctor in America. Um, he would help establish the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Uh, he would be a part of the San Antonio, Texas branch of it. And he wanted immediate racial equality granted to the African American community. All right. And then we also have Booker T. Washington. He wanted to, he pushed for gradual equality, like slowly gaining it, focus on getting job training, getting better jobs, making more money. Uh, he's going to es help establish the Tuskegee Institute, which is one of the first all African American schools, like colleges, in the country. Uh, it is still a very important school today. Uh, World War II, you know, we're going to see airmen who came from there. They were Tuskegee Airmen. They were one of the greatest, if not the greatest, American fighter pilot group of World War II. And this gradual equality that he's talking about is get your education, get that job, start making that money. And then once we have that to us and we're making money like, like the other people, uh, equality will follow afterward. So it's like pick yourself up and then get the equality. All right, last reformer that we're going to talk about is Miss Ida B. Wells. Uh, she was a journalist and newspaper editor. She would be one of the earliest leaders for the civil rights movement, okay? Uh, she would organize a national anti-lynching crusade. So she's bringing a lot of attention to the fact that lynchings are happening. 
you know, she's shown that over 700 men and women have been lynched in just 10 years. That is insane, right? So she's actually going to push for like a law change to happen, like um, anti lynching laws with like Congress. It's not going to work, but she creates a national awareness of the problem, which is going to help like eventually get rid of it to where there'll be fewer and fewer lynchings going on to where there's like none. All right, that is where we are going to be ending for today. Uh, when we come back next time, we will be talking about more westward expansion during the later part of the 1800s. All right, I will see you next time, guys.